whole slew of emotions going through my mind right now. I have uh, many things to say, but now that I hear that we have Kate, I guess I'm going to have to cut a few points out. <laughs> to start off and uh, say a few thank yous. Uh, I mean, I have to thank every single person in here, and I love you. Uh, I mean, the meatballs that Mike and Helen made were amazing. Uh, uh, staying at the Grimes house this summer, it was just like staying at home. I mean, I had two little brothers and parents. I mean, it, really, they it, it felt just like that. And, uh, they accepted me as one of their own from the very beginning. I just, I loved it. Uh, the Draculix, they were just awesome teaching their kids in children's church and um, getting to know them and putting on some new activities with them. And, uh, Tim being faithful, making the coffee every week, I really appreciated that. And uh, the, the Alvises, when they came, uh, it's just, I don't know, it's like I got more siblings in the family. And, uh, it's just, you know, it, it's been an awesome time. And then every Wednesday, hanging out with the Freemans, the Freeman night, uh, I really appreciate it. And I just, I want to say thankful to, thank you to all of you. Um, it's been awesome being here and uh, getting to know all of you. It's been an awesome uh, 10 weeks. We've gotten a lot done, um, and uh, it's just insane to think that it's already over. Um, you know, time flies when you're having fun, I guess, and apparently we had a lot of fun this summer. Um, we got to build a couple shells, like I said, and we got to do some painting and trim the hedges, had several missions teams come in. And, uh, it's just insane to look back at this summer and <clears throat> see all the work that we've seen to have gotten accomplished, and it's awesome. And then I, I look back and I see all the things that God has accomplished this summer. Uh, the Rib Fest, we made several connections with people at the Rib Fest. And, uh, to see those connections coming through, people uh, being faithful to the church. Robert and Heather, I think of you guys, and I'm thankful that you guys have stayed faithful um, this entire time. And it's just, it, it's been amazing. We go to camp with the teens, and the power goes out, and the plumbing backs up, and kids still make decisions for God, and it's it's stuff like that that keeps you going. Um, it's been awesome to see uh, the Lord work <coughs> this summer, and um, today I'd like to talk to you uh, as you're here about being a part of God's building program. I'm not talking about uh, building shelves. I'm not talking about uh, hey, I'll I'll mow the lawn at the church. I'm talking about spiritual things. Um, I, I want to talk to you today about being a part of. God's building program. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. And I thank you for what you've done in my heart with this message. And I pray that you will help me, Lord, to just be a tool for you, Lord, to, to be used of you this morning to share your word with your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will turn in your Bibles with me to Nehemiah 3. <clears throat> Nehemiah 3. Um, we'll begin reading in. Uh, Verse 1. It says, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Even unto the tower of Mia, they sanctified it unto the tower of Hanania. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho. And next unto him builded Zachar, the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build, who also laid beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz. And next unto them repaired Meshalom, the son of Berechiah, the son of... There's a lot of Jewish names that I don't really know how to pronounce. <laughs> and I'm not going to read through the entire thing with you. But um, I would like to look at, at one thing. Um, there, several times throughout this list you will see um, people listed building the wall of, of Jerusalem that were not builders. Um, it says uh, in verse... Second. It talks about uh, goldsmiths crafting things. It talks about musicians crafting things, crafting the wall. Um, it talks about uh, men that had occupations that were the opposite of building the wall, helping in building this wall. Um, and so I, to, to, to get rid of one myth that say, maybe in some of our minds this morning, uh, the building program of God is not just for preachers. And the building program for God is not just for people that are getting paid to do it. Um, the men in this story are built, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, and they're not getting paid for it. Um, they're not, that, that's not their job. They're rebuilding the, the wall of the city of God, not for their own benefit, but, but because it's the city of God, and they're helping rebuild um, God's kingdom. And so I'd like to dis dispel that myth this morning. Um, I'm not just talking to Brother Daryl 
and Brother Darren this morning and Brother Tony. Um, we're talking to everyone in here about being a part of God's building program because God's word is for all of us and God's kingdom is for all of us and so we all need to be a part of it. So um, this morning as we're talking about the building program of God, I'd like to give you just two warnings and then a word of encouragement as we uh, embark on this building program. First of all, uh, if you switch, flip over to, to Nehemiah 4, I just wanted to get, to get to set the background of the story of Nehemiah 3, but if you switch over to Nehemiah 4 with me, um, first of all, I'm going to be talking about the enemy without. If you look in verse 1, it says, Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. We can first of all see that Sanballat, uh, this is a Samaritan, he was not uh, the typical good Samaritan, um, he was a bad Samaritan. Um, if you look at Jewish history, you know, we think of Samaritan, I automatically have a positive thing in my mind. Okay, that's a good person, because the Samaritans are all good. Uh, the Jews didn't think that way. That, that was their enemy. And so the sand ballot here, looking at the Jews building this wall, gets really upset that they're building this wall and rebuilding uh, the city of Jerusalem. So he says that, that he was furious with the Jews for even trying to rebuild the wall. He said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the rubbish and burned ones at that? Can they take these burned stones and rebuild a city with them? What are they even trying to do? Uh, then we see Tobiah, the Ammonite, come. This guy is a, a supreme encourager. He says, um, yes, what are they doing? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Um, the Jews are in quite a heap of ridicule right now trying to rebuild this city, uh, and all their enemies are around them, jeering at them and laughing at them and scorning them. We were at the Seawolves game the other day, and uh, if you're familiar with the Seawolves games at all, they always have a strikeout man. Um, and, you know, if that guy strikes out, you all get McDonald's coupons. So, obviously, you know, when, when everybody else gets up to bat, um, you know, everybody's just generally rude. But when this guy gets up to bat, everybody turns into Satan. And, like, this guy is basically getting screamed at from every angle. Uh, people are making annoying noises. People are just doing whatever they can to get this guy to miss the ball. And, um, you know, I, we went with Brother Jim Jackson the other day, too, uh, to the game. And if you ever just want to go and have a fun time, bring Jim Jackson to a baseball game and listen to him trash talk the other team. He's hilarious. He is so funny. Um, I don't... <laughs> I, I don't know what it, he just, oh, if I was on the team, I would be so annoyed. I, I don't think I'd be able to hit the ball. Um, I'll tell you, he's, he's a hoot when it comes to baseball. But um, We can kind of get an idea of how the Jews are feeling here. As they're trying to do what they've been trained to do or what, what they're called to do, they have people around them jeering and talking trash talk and uh, getting annoyed, may, trying to get them annoyed, trying to get them distracted. Uh, trying to make sure they cannot accomplish what they're trying to get accomplished. Uh, so the Jews prayed to the Lord, we see in verse uh, 4 through 6. It says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunts on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in the land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. So they kept on working and they got the, the wall built up about halfway. And they, they're probably feeling pretty good about themselves. Man, you know, I'm sure glad we got it this far. We're getting a little bit more protected in our city. Then things start heating up. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry, and they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. Uh, we see that the enemy does not just want to get us confused or get us distracted. The enemy wants to destroy us. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the, de the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. The devil does not just, he's not just interested in getting us distracted or getting us, uh, you know, just off track and not really working to, to get what God wants accomplished. No, he's, he's interested in destroying lives. And uh, we need to be vigilant uh, of that fact. Because we can't just walk around this life expecting everything to be 
happy-go-lucky and no problem. So the devil, the devil is out to get uh, those that he can. Verses 11, verse 11 says, And our enemies said, They will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said unto us ten times, You must return to us. Basically saying, you've got to get out of here. You're going to get killed. You've got to get out of the city. Uh, just, just leave it. Just leave it. Now, these guys seriously don't want the Jews rebuilding this wall. They're threatening to kill them because they're building this wall. Now, you can imagine being that strikeout hitter. Um, it's, it's hard when people are just jeering at you. But can you imagine being that strikeout hitter? And you know for a fact, if you don't strike out, you're going to get killed. I mean, if somebody had sent you a letter and said, if you don't strike out, I'm going to kill you because I really want a free Big Mac. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not hitting the ball. Uh, I'm going to swing and miss every time. Uh, why? Because sports are not that important to me. I get pretty competitive, but if it's between it getting a run and my life, I'm sorry. We're going to lose. Um, and you kind of, that mindset, it's like, no, duh, you're not going to hit the ball. Well, imagine these Jews here. I wonder if they ever had that mindset of, why are we even building this wall? It, I mean, we're only going to get killed for it. This is suicide. Uh, they, there's enemies all around. This is a rinky-dink wall. That Ammonite guy is right. The, the fox can break this thing down. We're not protected in here. Why don't we just leave? And my personal opinion is that they did start feeling that way. Um, listen to what uh, verse 13 says. It says, so in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with swords, their spears, and their bows. Nehemiah here, in charge, takes the people of, of Israel and he positions them around the wall to protect it. And my, like I said, I, I know for a fact that he can sense fear because look what he says in the next verse. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid. You don't tell somebody not to be afraid unless you think they're afraid. Um, obviously, these guys were, were, were scared out of their minds to stand and try and protect this little rinky-dink wall. He says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah saw fear in the eyes of his men. But verse 15 says, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction, and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held a weapon in his other. Can you, I don't know if you guys... Uh, I cannot imagine putting a shelf together holding a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. I mean, it was hard enough just doing it with two hands. But to hold a spear in one hand and be laying mortar with the other, I don't know, that, that just seems extremely difficult. Um, but the idea is that they're working on what needs to be worked on, but they're also working on the, the, the enemy that's present. Um, like I said in verse Peter, the, the devil is trying to destroy. We can't just go imagine God's work to be easy. We have to be vigilant. The key word is vigilance. He said, um, And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be in guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. They were sleeping with their swords. They were sleeping in their clothes, always ready, always watching for the enemy's attack. Because the enemy... Uh, the enemy's not going to attack at noon, when the sun's up and you can see him. Uh, he's not going to attack, he's not going to send you a letter and say, hey, uh, I'm going to be there between 1 and 1.30, uh, can you go get lunch during that time? He's not going to do that, and then the devil doesn't do that. He's not, you have to be vigilant every hour of the day, and every minute of every hour. 
because he attacks when you least expect it. So we can see that the solution to the problem with the enemy without is a correct perspective of God. Notice every time they overcame the enemy was when Nehemiah said, remember the Lord, or the Lord will fight for us. Because, and, and if you go ahead and put the next slide, this is a saying that I heard a while ago. It says, don't remind God how big the storm is. Remind the storm how big your God is. Mm -hmm. When we realize who we're fighting for and who's fighting for us, there's no fear. There, there's vigilance, yes, we can fall, but when we realize just how big our God is, there's nothing to fear. So the children of Israel are continuing the work on the wall with vigilance. Uh, vigilance is the key word here. I enjoy going up to uh, the Bayfront. There's a little inlet, and I sit there and I skip rocks, and I haven't told anybody this story because it's kind of embarrassing. Um, so I'm sitting there skipping rocks one day, and I'm like, man, I did this pretty sunset. I need to take a picture for my mom. So I go back to my car, charge my phone for a little bit, and run back up to the, the, the shore. And while I'm running up, this little black furry creature, I don't know if it was a skunk or not, but it, it, it ran from where I was at, and it ran into the bushes. So I was like, okay, I just need to be, make sure that I stay away from that bush, because if it's a skunk, I'm getting sprayed. And I do not, you know how embarrassing that would be to come home smelling like a skunk? Like, what happened? Oh, Nothing. Yeah. And so, you know, so I just sit in there, you know, skipping a rock from the thing, and I got rid of all the good rocks that were sitting there, so I just started moving around and came over this way, away from the bush, and started going around. And finally, I'm just sitting there getting distracted, and I'm walking, and I grab some more rocks, and I'm skipping. And next thing I know, I'm sitting next to the bush. And I look in and see two little beady eyes looking at me, and I like bolted things in the car. And I'm like, oh my word, and what happened? I got so distracted with what I was doing, I forgot that there was a little creature sitting there. And uh, the same thing, we have to be watching every moment. We can't let ourselves get distracted. We have to be vigilant. So we saw the enemy without, and now let's look at the enemy within. This is in Nehemiah 5. Uh, it says, Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, We have borrowed money for the king's tax and on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it, for other men have our fields and our vineyards. Kind of hard to understand without the background. Um, basically what had happened, the Jews have been dispersed, and now Nehemiah has come to Jerusalem. And some Jews have already come to Jerusalem and were inhabiting the area. And what they were doing is they were going to the nations that had taken these Jews and buying their brothers and their sisters back to bring them back to Jerusalem. So, these Jews that are here now that Nehemiah has come to help build the wall, they have been saved, they have been freed from other nations that were enslaving them. But as you can imagine, they're not working to make money right now. They don't have much money, and there's a famine in the land, and so they're in a pretty tight economical situation. They don't have a lot of money. Notice it says, we have a lot of sons and daughters, we need food, help us out. And what was happening is the poor... We're asking the richer Jews, can you help us out with, with some food? Can you give us some land? Can you give us something that we can survive? And the richer Jews were taking advantage of the poorer Jews. And they were abusing them, literally. They, the, the poorer Jews had just been saved from the other nations, and now they're being enslaved to their own people. They're, they're being abused by their own people. Um, that's not good. <laughs> Uh, here they are putting their jobs on hold to help rebuild the city of God. And a few Jews allowed the circumstances that were surrounding them to make them concerned only about themselves. They didn't care about their, their brother. They didn't care about their sister. They were just concerned about their own financial or their own state. They did not care to the point that they were abusing other Jews. <clears throat> we live in tough times, don't we? It's very easy sometimes to make it a church when we know that we got a bill or we got something to pay and, and I can be working on Sunday. It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to give your time when, man, I need to get my lawn mowed. I need to, I need to go get my car fixed. Um, it's not easy. 
Um, and it can be very easy to get distracted and only think about ourselves. Verses 7 through 10, it says, I took counsel with myself, and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, You are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them, and said to them, We, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. Imagine that. Uh, so I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of God, to prevent the taunts of the nations of our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Nehemiah says, look, what you're doing is wrong. Shouldn't you be living in the fear of God? God is the one that is getting this work going. God is the one that's taking care of us. Why are you so worried about the enemies around you or about your own financial circumstance? God is the one that is holding us up. Stop abusing others to, to try and get yourself ahead. And why don't you just rely on God for once? And he says, uh, moreover, or even beyond that, me and my <coughs> servants are lending money. So basically saying, stop taking from them, and why don't you start giving to them? Why don't you start helping somebody out instead of worrying about yourself? Uh, be, a, be a giver, not a taker. I want to say today, ask not what Flagship Church can do for you, but ask what you can do for Flagship Church. I'm not just talking about finances. I'm not just talking about maybe mowing the lawn. I'm talking about, and I'm not just talking about this building. Because this building is not flagship church. We as a congregation are flagship church. We as a people are flagship church. Uh, you, you come and paint a wall, good for you, but you're not really helping the church out spiritually. You're not really helping the people of God. The people of God are the church. So I want to challenge you. Be a part of God's building program in the church. And we see that the solution to the enemy within is also a renewal of a correct perspective of God. He says to the enemy without, don't be afraid of them because God is fighting for us. He says to the people within, stop because God is fighting for us. He says, why aren't you living in a fear of our God? So we see the enemy without, we see the enemy within. Now I just like to offer a word of encouragement. In chapter 7, uh, spoiler alert, uh, they did get the wall built. And... Uh, <laughs> Nehemiah gathers everyone together. And it says, Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people to be enrolled by genealogy. And I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up at first, and I found written in it. These were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried into exile. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ram, Ramia. Uh, again, Jewish names are kind of um, a tongue tie, but Bilshan, Mispareth, Bigvi, Nahum, Banna. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Paras, 2172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Ara, 652. And the numbers go on. I know what you're thinking. What do these names have to do with anything? Well, to you sitting here today, a name of some Jewish guy named Bilshan has nothing to do with anything. And I'm not going to try and make a spiritual point out of Bilshan. Um, but to some Jewish person, Bilshan was the name of someone that had been rescued. Uh, Bilshan was the name of someone who had helped get someone rescued. So na naming off these names, some little Jewish boy is in there, I remember that guy. I remember him. I remember when he came to my to the nation that had taken me. And I remember when he bought me back. Or Bill Sean is, I remember when I went and I talked to him. Or moving over into contemporary. Revelation 20 talks about a book called the Book of Life. And it contains the names of everyone who has accepted Christ as their Savior who has placed their faith in Christ for salvation. Can you imagine being in heaven someday and hearing as the names are called off 
and hearing a name and thinking, I remember that guy. I remember when I went door knocking. I remember when I was at the Rib Fest. And I, I remember being a part of that person's life and bringing them back to the kingdom. I remember when they got saved. I remember when they were bought back. Can you imagine the joy of knowing that you had a part in bringing someone back to God? And, and restoring a relationship between that person and God. And Brother Darrell said a comment the other day. He said, you were either a missionary or you were a mission field. You were either going and trying to win others to Christ, or you are the person that needs to be brought to Christ. You're either, even if you're a Christian, if, if you're not going and, and, and wanting to bring others to Christ, then, then you need to get right with God. Um, that's just the truth. But can you imagine, as that book is open, hearing a name of someone, and knowing that you had a part in building the kingdom of God. And what a joy to know that we have a part in that. That we get to stand before God and say, I was part. Lord, not because of anything that I have done, but because you bought me and because you brought me to the kingdom, Lord, I had a part in bringing others. And so if you would stand and bow your heads.